Hello and welcome to the online information session for the south portion of the Fleming site. My name is John Dawson. I'm the Director of Educational Planning at the Vancouver School Board. Other members of the panel will be introduced in a few moments. This is the first of two uh, online information sessions we're hosting tonight um, for stakeholders and the public. The next session will be on at 7 p.m. and you're welcome to attend that one as well. Next slide, please. This design you're seeing in front of you was created by the Coast Salish artist Susan Point. Um, a yellow cedar carving with the same image is displayed in the lobby of the VSB. The piece celebrates the role of salmon in the West Coast existence and celebrates the connection between all living beings. The reflection of four carries important, uh, important meanings as it represents the four seasons, the four winds, the four directions, and the four elements, which must be respected for their gifts of life. With that, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting tonight on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Coast Salish peoples. Next slide, please. Just a housekeeping note, this meeting is being live streamed and the audio and visual recording will also be available to the public for viewing after the meeting. The footage of the meeting can also be viewed inside and outside of Canada. There are translation services available on the Teams platform, and these can be turned on using video controls. These will provide closed captioning services in multiple languages. I'd like to pass uh, the microphone, uh, the virtual microphone to David Green, Secretary Treasurer of the VSB. Thank you, John. As John mentioned, um, we're here tonight to talk as a public information session to talk about the uh, south portion of the Sir Sanford Fleming school site. Um, as we know, the, there's a brand new school at Sir Sanford Fleming um, that is a result of the um, project in the seismic mitigation program. And uh, it was located at the opposite end of where the, the original school was on the site. And the, uh, the site is, or the original school is now being in the process of being demolished. And the, um, <clears throat> the south end of that site is now going to be um, available for um, other use. Perhaps the, the board has, as we'll see later in the presentation, the board has um, passed a motion to consider the, um, that the site maybe not maybe surplus to the future educational needs of the school district. Um, so as we get into this tonight, I'd like to um, first of all acknowledge that uh, we have with us tonight um, Andrew Bajan from Urban Systems, who's um, consultants who have been helping us with um, some of our land asset strategy work. So I'll pass it over to you, Andrew, to introduce yourself, and um, and then you can pass it back to John so he can uh, introduce uh, his team to the meeting. OK, thanks. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Bajent, and I'm a community planner with Urban Systems in our Vancouver office. And I work closely with the Vancouver School Board to examine uh, potential repurposing of uh, sites that may be deemed surplus to future educational needs, thus uh, the meeting tonight on the Fleming site. John, I'll pass it back to you. Uh, thank, thanks, Andrew. And, and uh, I'd like uh, members of the VSB team to introduce themselves and then pass, uh, state their name and position and then pass the uh, virtual mic to the next member of the team. Uh, it takes a bit of a while. There's a bit of a lag in the camera. So I'd like to have, uh, pass it next to James to do. Uh, thank you, John. Good evening. Uh, my name is James to Hope. I'm a senior manager of planning with Vancouver School Board. I'll pass the uh, virtual mic over to Hayden O'Connor. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, this is Hayden O'Connor, facilities planner with the Vancouver uh, School Board. And perhaps I'll introduce uh, Michael Rossi. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, my name is Michael Rossi. I'm a district 
principal here at the Vancouver School District. I'll pass the virtual mic over to Tamin. Thanks, Michael. My name is Tamin Kim. I'm a facilities planner at Vancouver School Board. Thanks, Tamin. And we also have um, supporting us this evening, Sarah Chow from the Allied uh, Information Technology Division and Alison Bailey from the communications uh, team who will be uh, providing moderation services as questions come in later in the uh, in the session. So uh, back to David Green now for the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the objectives for the information session tonight um, are numerous actually. So first of all, it's important that we provide you with um, avenues to provide feedback and input into the process. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we're going to look at the details of board policy 20, which is disposal of land or improvements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the board motion to consider the site being um, uh, surplus to district future educational needs is the first step in, in, that, in that policy. Uh, when we look at uh, per, perhaps a, an eventual disposal. Uh, there's going to be some conversation about the opportunities and benefits of land asset management. And we'll also explain the engagement process stages and timeline and throughout the presentation, and there will be some specific information about the Fleming site itself. The next information, next uh, slide, please. So this is, um, this is a site that's been set up on our school district website uh, for for providing feedback and, and for providing information to you and feedback from you. Um, like, as it says here, we will be giving, you know, the site information, there's some staff reports in there right now. Uh, we'll be providing updates on the project as it goes forward. And there's a link in here to a feedback survey, which is gonna be open between April 13th and, and the 28th. Next slide, please. Okay, so the agenda, the specific agenda for tonight then is to start off with the talking about board policy 20, disposal of land or improvements, and then the actual engagement process and timeline itself, and more information about the Fleming site and concepts for future use. And as I mentioned earlier, mechanism to provide feedback and staying informed throughout the process. And then finally, an opportunity for questions and answers. So I believe it's back to you, John. <clears throat> Thanks, David. So land disposition is the process of either entering into a long-term lease or the sale of a, of a piece of land, in this case, a uh, subdivided parcel of land on the Fleming site. And I guess the main point of this slide is that uh, this is a regulated process. So there is uh, legislation within the School Act that governs uh, and sets out requirements for the sale or lease of a piece of land. And there's also a BSB policy 20, which has further details about the process. Next slide, please. So a little bit of further detail about uh, board policy 20. It, it actually separates into two distinct phases for the process. And uh, an important note is that the phases are sequential, meaning that phase two, which we'll, we'll come back to in more detail, will not begin until we're completed phase one. So one of the focuses of the information tonight is to help you, uh, you know, provide feedback on the consideration that this piece of the Fleming site be considered a surplus to the educational needs of the district. And then once that uh, process is complete, uh, then we proceed to phase two, which is the actual disposition, which is the lease or sale process. Next slide, please. So uh, this process tonight, um, so board, board policy 20 is, is a process that just exists for any uh, sale or leasing, but this particular process tonight was kicked off uh, and moved forward by this board motion as of February 22nd, which reads the Board of Education approved proceeding with the initial consultation process as described in policy 20, disposal of land or improvements to consider the potential declaration of the southern portion of the Fleming School site as surplus to the educational needs of the school district. So uh, that motion, which was approved by the board on February 22nd, has, has kicked off the process. And here we are at the consultation phase tonight. 
um, for clarity uh, improvements is, is buildings. And tonight we're just simply discussing the sale of a portion of a piece of land. So there are no buildings, uh, sale or leasing of a piece of land. Uh, there are no buildings uh, under consideration tonight. Next slide. Here's, here's a bit more of a graphical um, detail and timeline for the first phase of the policy 20 disposition process. So there was a report back in March to the facilities planning committee which set out some details about how staff intended to go forward. Uh, here we are tonight on April 13th, the uh, yellow or orange circle um, having this these two sessions and the survey link is now open on, on the web site that was mentioned earlier and, and will be mentioned again later. And, and it's very important um, that we receive feedback through that survey mechanism. That is our main mechanism for receiving feedback that can be analyzed and uh, fully presented to the board. So after the survey closes, uh, staff will be preparing a report to bring to the facilities planning committee on May 5th, which will be a, a consulting report and we'll have a complete analysis of the feedback received as a result of this engagement. Um, and that will be presented on May 5th for the consideration of the committee. And there will be a recommendation at that time for the board to consider which they will bring forward to a uh, public board meeting on May 25th. So that is that is the timeline and details for phase one of this process. And then once phase one is concluded, we'd move into phase two, which is the disposition process itself. And phase two would commence with work by, by staff to prepare a request for proposals from proponents uh, in, in the community. This is a public public request for proposals. And uh, this is another place where uh, the survey feedback will be important because uh, if there's you know, themes that emerge from the survey will have an influence on the development of the RFP. If, for example, there's a large amount of support for uh, perhaps developing uh, affordable renting, rental housing as part of any development on the uh, portion of the land, that would influence the criteria set up in the uh, request for proposal process. Um, once the RFP has gone out and uh, the 90 day period has ended, um, then the information will come back from the proponents to staff for further evaluation and staff will make a recommendation to the board at a private meeting, which then the board will ch may choose to bring forward to a public meeting uh, to pass a bylaw amendment. This, this uh, phase two of the process would take um, approximately three to six months, all told. So those are the two phases of the disposition process set out in the policy. Um, there are some considerations as well uh, as part of the policy, and here they are. Um, you know, staff is meant to look at future enrollment growth and trends in the area, uh, potential for alternative community use, uh, need to provide an opportunity for fair consideration to community, community input, and also provide an adequate opportunity for community response. Next slide, please. So here's here are the things that have happened thus far um, with respect to the South Fleming site. Uh, we have confirmed that the VSB is the uh, owner of the land through a title search. And we've also had uh, preliminary discussions with the city of Vancouver to confirm that that portion of the site could be subdivided and that there are no barriers uh, that would prevent that from happening. Uh, for example, underground infrastructure such as electrical lines or sewage lines or, or that kind of thing. Um, and we've also conducted preliminary research staff has alongside uh, the urban systems team that has revealed that the site does have excellent potential for broad community benefits as well as generating capital revenue uh, for use by this, the board. Here's um, some graphical information about uh, enrollment at, at Fleming and as well as uh, Fleming within its family of schools, the David Thompson family of schools. So these charts uh, show historical and forecast enrollments. So the left hand chart is for Fleming School itself. Um, the, the student enrollment is on the on the uh, vertical axis and then the, the year, the associated year is on the horizontal axis. 
and the orange line represents the approximate number of students that can be adequately accommodated at the school. This is called operating capacity. So you can see that Fleming, the school itself, experienced a bit of an enrollment bulge, uh, peaking around 2016, 2017. And then since that time, enrollment has declined for, for four years until the red bar, which is where we are this year. And a bit of further forecast is declined in the coming years. So the school at the Fleming site should be able to accommodate all, all its catchment students for the sort of for many years for the foreseeable future. Um, Fleming, uh, you know, is in, a, is in a region with other schools, and this and David Thompson is the secondary school in that region, so it's called the David Thompson Family of Schools. So when we look at the elementary enrollment within all those schools, um, it's also uh, been stable, but started to decline in the past couple of years. So in the surrounding schools to Fleming, there's uh, not expected to be uh, further enrollment demand than exists right now. Next slide, please. So, you know, some summary points about uh, the Fleming site. The building has sufficient capacity to accommodate uh, future enrollment, and there's sufficient capacity in surrounding schools to accommodate enrollment demand at those sites. And the, and the building itself at Fleming is not designed to be expanded in the future. So um, the, the capacity at the Fleming site would actually be uh, not impacted by the subdivision and lease or sale of, of the piece at the south end of the site, of the piece of land at the south end of the site. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass um, it over to Michael Rossi, who uh, was the uh, educational lead on the seismic mitigation program project at the site, and he has some uh, more details about the planning site itself. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, John. Uh, like John said, uh, I'm going to take the next couple minutes just to go through what the new Fleming Elementary uh, currently looks like and uh, some of the amenities uh, that uh, the new Fleming Elementary currently has. Uh, so as mentioned before, through the seismic mitigation program, uh, Fleming received funding through the Ministry of Education to get a seismically safe building. Uh, and in this seismically safe building, they got a replacement building. Uh, this building incorporates 21st century design uh, principles, uh, which promotes collaboration, engagement, and inclusion of students. Uh, it also has what we call a neighborhood learning center or NLC space, uh, uh, which is incorporated within the building. Uh, that space can be utilized during the day for uh, during the day uh, by by the school. But then before and after school care can, can also operate out of that space. Uh, one of the unique things about Fleming uh, that, uh, that it has is a third floor child care or rooftop child care that uh, involved a partnership with the city of Vancouver. Uh, and that child care uh, allows uh, community members uh, ages zero to four child care to access that space. Uh, the school is uh, purposely designed on the northeast corner of the lot, uh, which uh, purposely brought it away from the busy intersection of 49th and Knight and uh, nestled it into the quieter edge of the, of, of the lot on Lanark Street. Next slide, please. So these are just a few uh, pictures of the current site again. Uh, so in the top left hand corner, the playground that was uh, previously closer to the old Fleming site has been relocated uh, closer to the new Fleming site. Uh, so it's uh, more educationally appropriate to the new building. Uh, the, uh, the bottom right corner, and I, I guess bo uh, both pictures shows the natural light that comes into uh, our new building at Fleming. This natural light obviously creates an inviting learning environment for both staff, students, and community members. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner uh, illustrates the NLC space or that neighborhood learning center space that is available to the school during the day and is utilized by before and after school care to provide uh, access to that space uh, to meet the com community's before and after school needs. Next slide, please. 
So this is a picture. Th these pictures are of the inside of the building. Uh, the top left-hand corner uh, displays sort of the sight lines that this building has. Uh, so this is a visual look into the gym location from the second floor of the building. Uh, so the building has been developed with great sight lines uh, for students to be able to uh, use each and every space uh, as much as possible. Uh, in the right hand side or on the right hand side, you, uh, it's a picture of what we call a classroom pod. And so there's four classrooms that lead on to this shared learning space uh, that encourages collaborations between between students and and staff. And uh, and each of these pod areas has a sensory room or a group room uh, for <coughs> for students to to utilize. The bottom left hand corner depicts uh, or is a picture of a, a classroom at Fleming. Uh, it is uh, designed so that uh, the, the building is designed so that the classrooms are facing away or the majority of the classrooms are facing away from Knight Street uh, because then the st staff and students can open the windows to bring in uh, that, that fresh air from the outside and they won't have the noise di disturbance of uh, Night Street as being the loud street uh, on site. Next slide, please. So this picture on the left hand side shows uh, a picture of the third floor childcare uh, that is uh, funded through the city of Vancouver. It's a zero to four uh, aged childcare and it's a 69 space childcare. Uh, as you can see, there's a playground space or an outdoor learning space for that zero to four childcare uh, on the third floor. Uh, that has great sight lines and natural light. And then on the right hand side there, it shows the great circulation space inside the school. As you can see in the bottom right hand corner, every space is utilized to its maximum capacity. And then in the top right hand corner, we have a picture of the learning commons or the library, also showing how bright that library is with all that natural light coming in. Again, creating that uh, inviting learning environment for all students and staff to uh, collaborate and, and work in. And next slide, please. And I'm going to hand this over to Andrew. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to have a couple slides here to uh, share with everyone some uh, examples of public land management. It's a passion of uh, area of mine and um, I work a lot with uh, different levels of government at uh, you know identifying land that might be surplus and then coming up with um, unique opportunities to usually uh, bridge a funding gap and um, maybe later during the, the Q&A if you have any specific questions you can ask but um, yeah I've worked with municipalities, First Nations, other school districts uh, in, in this capacity as well. So what is effective land asset management? Well, essentially, it's the identification of opportunities to capture land value through strategic and effective land management. Um, possible benefits to the school board, school district, and the communities that we live in uh, would include things such as generation of revenue from the lease or sale of surplus land holdings. And most of the, the, the organizations I work with choose to lease on a long-term basis. Um, another benefit is the, the use of the revenue to enhance uh, funding for capital projects, especially in the seismic mitigation uh, program, i.e. getting new schools, more new schools and upgraded schools. Um, and then of course there's the creation of opportunities to partner with other agencies to deliver vital public services, things like daycare. Fleming has a great example of uh, daycare and there's before and after school care. Uh, often affordable housing is a, is a primary objective. Uh, in North Vancouver, the school district uh, used this approach to um, help with some heritage preservation of two old schools and other community amenities. Um, there's really a lot of different examples that uh, are out there. Uh, Hayden, if you can advance to the next slide, please. So effective land asset management can help achieve many educational and facility goals. For example, it can help ensure modern, safe and healthy schools for our students. It helps accommodate students at their catchment school and it can also reduce operating costs and deferred maintenance costs, which are quite substantial. Next slide, please. 
So a question I hear all the time or a common question that we encounter is, you know, how can the revenue from a long-term lease or a sale be used to benefit the school district? Well, let's be clear, the top priority for revenue right now is to supplement the capital provided by the province to enhance the seismic program, i.e. build new replacement schools and reduce or eliminate deferred maintenance costs. Next slide, please, Hayden. We transition a bit and give you, uh, I mean, you, you live, most of the people on this uh, meeting live in a neighborhood, but I'm still going to give a little bit of an overview of the site and walk you through some of the, um, the planning considerations. Um, as, as you know, there's a, you know, there's a proposed subdivision area along 49th Avenue. Uh, the proposed lot would just be in front of the, uh, the original school. And it would all front 49th. You can see in the image there within the uh, the blue rectangle. Uh, the development site would be approximately 2,450 uh, square meters or just over half an acre, the 0 0.6 of an acre to be exact. The western third of the proposed new lot is currently zoned C1, uh, which is for commercial uh, shops, restaurants, things like that. Um, whereas the remainder of the lot uh, along the length of uh, 49th is actually zoned RS1, uh, which allows for uh, single family homes and lots. Next slide, please. So how does the new school demolition of the old school and the new uh, lot relate to one another? Um, is, is something I'll walk you through now. If you actually look closely on this image, you can see a dashed white line that indicates uh, where the boundary of the the, uh, the southern portion that we're talking about tonight falls. Um, as Michael just explained, the new school is, is in the northeast corner of the site, at the corner of Lanark and uh, 47th, away from a uh, night. Um, the old school facing 49th will soon be demolished. And so essentially the new lot uh, would encompass that hard surface paved area that's in front of the original school building. Now, one thing I do want to point out about the original school building is it's 65 feet high, which is approximately the same height as a modern six story building. So if we go to the next um, slide, please, Hayden. What could a repurposing look like at this site? Well, as I just mentioned, the existing zoning would allow a three-story mixed-use development at the corner of 49th and Knight, as well as a few single-family lots. We have done some preliminary repurposing options and put together some illustrations, which I'll share with you in a minute. Uh, and we've explored, you know, at a high level, uh, how the land could be used. And additional work would be undertaken if the board approves proceeding to phase two. Um, some initial land valuation uh, work suggests that anywhere from $7 million to $20 million could result from the repurposing of the site. Now, I need you to keep in mind that that seven to $20 million is is almost directly tied to the level of development there. So you can imagine under current zoning with uh, the commercial on the corner and four single family lots, you'd be about that $7 million. And as you put more development on the site, you could get closer to the 20 million uh, return to the school board. Uh, next slide, please. So what might the repurposing look like? Um, as I mentioned, we prepared some preliminary concepts, some, some illustrations that I'll walk you through here, uh, just to help visualize what potential development could look like um, on this site. I do want to point out at uh, above the illustrations, there's a, a chart there that goes from 7 million to 20 million. That was uh, what I was just explaining how the different levels of development on the site um, as development increases, the potential return to the school district uh, increases. Um, so let me walk you through each of these. Um, the first one is essentially what current zoning would allow. That's the C1 zone that you you see you'd have a, a three-story building on the corner of Knight and 49th. And then the RS1 zone would essentially allow four single family lots to, to, to be placed on, on the site. The next example shows a four-story mixed-use building. This would require rezoning. 
And my expectation is the city would look to what they call a comprehensive development zone, a CD zone, to direct development here. Um, in this scenario, a four-story wood frame building would have uh, ground oriented or on the main floor would be commercial and retail, as well as perhaps some office with three stories of residential above. The next image shows a six story and uh, with changes to the building code, we can now do six story wood frame as well. So that would be a wood frame building and um, it would have the same be offices and uh, retail on the ground floor and five stories of uh, residential above. The final image is essentially uh, the third, but with a much taller building at the corner of uh, Knight and 49th. And that building could be anywhere from eight to 14 stories. When you get to that height, wood is no longer possible, at least not under current building code. Uh, so that would be a concrete structure. Uh, but it would also uh, promise the greatest return uh, for uh, the school board. And then I guess in a nutshell, the way I always like to look at this is um, the, the more density or more development on a site, the more money there is for the priorities of the school board. And in this case, you know, the more money that could be raised at this uh, location, uh, the more money there is for a seismic mitigation program or there's additional funds for full replacement schools. Or as I mentioned earlier, there's a great opportunity to reduce the deferred maintenance costs. And of course, uh, with more development on the site, you have more opportunity to uh, incorporate affordable housing or workforce housing. Obviously, the, the first one uh, with current zoning doesn't provide as much opportunity with four single family homes as some of the other ones that have many more units above the shops. Hayden, if you could just advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. And so another question is, what are the potential community benefits of repurposing this site? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, modern, safe and healthy schools are a community benefit. And we need more projects like the Fleming replacement project in our city. Um, other community benefits are, you know, everything has been designed here to provide an additional buffer uh, for the students uh, from that busy intersection at 49th and, and Knight. Um, and as I just mentioned, there's opportunities here to provide affordable housing uh, in a part of the city that has pr primarily single family. There is other multifamily, but there's an opportunity here to uh, on the corner have uh, enough residential units so that um, affordable housing and workforce housing is a viable option in your neighborhood. Now, I know this was a fairly brief overview of both public land management and some of the preliminary options we've discussed and explored for repurposing at the south end of Fleming site. Um, once we conclude the presentation, I would be more than happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone might have. So with that, I'll pass it back to John Dawson. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that, uh, that helpful information as it helps people kind of start to visualize and think about uh, some possibilities for that site. So we're, we're, we're drawing to the close of the uh, formal presentation. Um, just a, another reminder about the importance of completing that feedback survey. It's at that same site. Our intention is to keep on posting information at that same site where the links to the session were posted, feedback surveys there, and, and, and project information and staff reports are, are posted. And finally, so the next section of this engagement is open uh, for your questions and, and uh, people on the uh, staff panel will and, and Andrew will be providing answers as those questions come in. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks for your attention. And, and now I'll turn it over to Alison uh, to see what's what's on the docket. Yes, uh, several questions have come in, John. Um, number one, how is a site constituted as surplus? So perhaps, um, uh, John, could you, sure. could you answer this one? Thank, thanks, Alison. So um, the considerations for whether the site is, is surplus to the needs are, are set out in uh, the board policy 20. So that's a future need for educational programming. So there needs to be fair consideration of whether the site is in fact needed for to provide K-12 or adult ed programming or any sort of programming in the VSD. And, um, that, that would generally pertain to a building. We were considering um, you know, this, the leasing of a building to, a, to another tenant, 
but I guess you could consider the needs of the children at the school in terms of place, place and so on in that. So that would be a consideration. And so that, that's one main consideration. The other ones are, are set out there as, you know, how, are there looking at alternative community uses, getting feedback from the public and providing time for that feedback to come in. So this is again the importance of the, sur the survey because people, uh, one of the questions on the survey is, um, you know, about whether this site is in fact surplus to the needs of the school board. Um, I don't know, Andrew, do you have anything else to add to that one? But that's the process itself. The, the board will be, or, or David is. I think I think I could add, you know, when when the um, this this site will become a remnant site is what we refer to it as a remnant site. When when the, the old building is demolished, there's going to be a parking lot and a play field for the new school. So right behind the the, the rectangle site is, is going to be a parking lot for the for the school, and um, so that makes that site like really surplus to the to the needs of the build, uh, needs of the school site itself. So. OK, and uh, along the same lines, I know um, this was discussed in the presentation, but this is uh, obviously a lot of information. So maybe we can um, just review when the board passed a motion that the site may be surplused for educational needs. And uh, John, can you take this one? Sure. Thanks again, Allison. Yeah, so um, the, the, this process was initiated with the board motion on February 22nd. Um, and, and the board, uh, I think at the board meeting that evening, um, indicated that motion had been passed the private board prior to the, the public board meeting. So that's what initiated this process on February 22nd. Okay, and uh, what sites did Urban Systems look at? Has that report been shared with the trustees? Um, Andrew, are you able to answer this? Or James, perhaps? I, I don't mind taking it. We're, we're working closely with the trustees looking at a number of different uh, sites, and this is just one. Uh, what I can say is that, you know, um, we focused on what we call non enrolling sites. And so, um, yeah, we it's an ongoing process. And um, yeah, so far so good in terms of identifying uh, potential areas for uh, repurposing that don't impact any of the students or uh, families. Okay, and how does the Fleming site compare against the site at McGee on West 49th and Maple, where a very uh, where there's a very similar layout? Did Urban Systems also deem that site potentially surplus, Andrew? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, th th there's. Uh, there's only 10 that have been identified so far out of 117 different sites. So uh, McGee is, is now one that I'll take a closer look at, I guess. But uh, in terms of the ones we're working on right now, there's only 10. So um, if I could just add to that. So so there is a land asset, you know, there's been some work done in the background of land asset management, but the, the, the goal of tonight's engagement is to uh, focus uh, on getting feedback on the Fleming site on the merits of this proposal. So um, the, the McGee site, you know, could be looked at, but McGee is fundamentally different than Fleming in that there are currently three schools at that site, uh, two elementary schools, uh, at Maple Grove site, which is contiguous with McGee and a full-size high school. So whereas uh, Secretary Green just mentioned, this site is, is a small vestige of the old site, the existing site along a busy arterial road at, at, you know, at a busy intersection. So really looking for feedback on this proposal tonight. And why does the VSB need to dispose of lands? Um, maybe John or um, perhaps David Green? Uh, thank you, Allison. I think the, um, you know, Andrew mentioned it in, in the presentation. I mean, we have, we have a size mitigation program that is, um, focused um, primarily from the government's perspective on seismic upgrading of schools as opposed to replacement of schools. Um, so we obviously need capital funding to enhance those sorts of projects where the site is big enough to uh, build a new school uh, as opposed to just seismic upgrading the existing building. Because when you build a new school, 
Um, obviously, it has a, a, a longer life lifespan, and it, it also has you know new new systems of um, operational systems in it, and it eliminates the deferred maintenance problem that we have in the district with our older buildings and the older systems that are in those buildings. So it's really um, the need is really there to enhance those sorts of programs. Um, but also, like Andrew mentioned, I mean, there's other opportunities too uh, for capital, for using capital revenue um, down the road. He mentioned um, the projects in North Vancouver where they put some money into heritage pre preservation and those sorts of things. So the, um, <clears throat> but I think the primary objective for us right now in Vancouver would be to focus on the seismic mitigation program and building replacement schools where we can. Could I just okay. add a little bit more about um, to Secretary Green comment about the seismic mitigation program? Um, when when a project is advanced for funding, um, the commitment of the ministry after a feasibility study is to is to fund the least cost option. So that's often you know a, a upgrade a school upgrade is considered, or a replacement school, or sometimes a partial replacement. And often there's a, a cost differential between the ministry's commitment to funding and what it would take to build a new replacement school. And and the funding differences are in the order of millions of dollars, maybe 10% of the project cost often. And so this is what we're looking at is, is enhancing funding that's coming from the Ministry of Education to get new schools, replacement schools, which would otherwise be just older buildings that are just simply updated to be made safe, but aren't, aren't improved into modern, safe, healthy, exciting learning uh, environments like like Fleming is. So that, that's one of the uses with, with respect directly with respect to the site mitigation program. OK, and a couple of questions related to uh, population forecasts for Fleming. So Fleming is a full school and has a kindergarten draw. So the statement that Fleming will have a declining population defies ground truth. How can this be explained? Perhaps John or Michael Rossi. I'll, I'll, I'll kick that off. So, so um, just just to reiterate, that Fleming does have declining enrollment. That's not that's not a forecast. That's that's a reality. That, that's what the first left side of that graph showed. Um, those are, are real numbers. And Fleming is a full school, meaning that it's operating at capacity. That's why the red bar in 2020 is sort of right on, pretty much right matching that orange line. Um, that orange line is not absolute truth because how the school is organized can can determine how many students can adequately be accommodated. But you can see that right now this year, Fleming is full and it's about at capacity. Uh, and you can see there's a down, been a downward trend that is actual ground truth for the past four years of Fleming enrollment and it's forecast to continue. Uh, right now, Fleming has a kindergarten waitlist of five students as of today. Um, we expect that waitlist will likely clear as the enrollment process proceeds. Uh, Michael, did you have anything more to add about the Fleming situation with respect to enrollment? No, I, I think you clearly identified uh, the fact that we're, we're right on capacity right now uh, at Fleming. And uh, as John said, we, we've seen that decline over the last three, three or so years, and it's forecasted to continue. Yeah. But I, I guess I'd just like to note, you know, there's a policy requirement to look at the, the future enrollment. But again, I think that's more related to if you were going to lease or, or sell a building. In this case, we're talking about a portion of the site. So whether or not that there's disposition of that portion of the site, it's, it's, it's not going to impact the school's ability to accommodate its, its catching students. And, and as I said in the, in the presentation, um, there's, there's no possibility of expanding capacity at the school. Um, so the cost of the school will remain the same regardless of uh, what what transpires in this process. OK, uh, next question. Is there a policy in terms of leasing versus selling of the land? How do you project the value of the land into the future? And uh, this perhaps be a question for David Green, James or Andrew? I think the um, 
it it talks about the board just recently passed a motion about um, focusing on um, leasing long term leases of land as opposed to um, outright sale of <clears throat> you know be simple sales. So Andrew mentioned earlier that you know his experience is that most most of these sort of disposals will end up in a long term lease situation and. You know, it's it's governed off by our board policy 20. Where it does talk about the um, the board's ability to dispose of partial sites. Um, <clears throat> and that came about as a result of a board motion that was passed in 2015. So the focus would be on a long term lease as opposed to a um, outright sale. I'm, uh, I'm happy to add a bit to that. Um, two things. One is, you know, it's a it's tough living in this uh, city with the price of uh, of land. We, we all struggle with that. Um, but what it's done is it's led to a situation where long term leases are worth almost as much as a fee, a simple sale. Um, so that is kind of the best of both worlds. You can lease it uh, and others can use it and you can be paid almost as much as uh, selling it in fee simple, uh, but then get the land back at the end of the term. And, um, you know, uh, this is very common in our region. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a form of tenure that First Nations pioneered. Uh, but the city of Vancouver uses it extensively. Um, uh, the airport, uh, the new shopping centre, when you go over the Arthur Lang Bridge, that's all long term lease. Uh, and the provincial government does and the federal government does and other school districts do. So. Um, I'm just trying to reassure everyone that uh, the long-term lease is, is a very viable option, and um, I think it's it's a wise choice by the school board. Okay, next question. All these options don't seem possible with a lease option, and trustees don't favor sale. How possible would it be to develop the property while VSB remains the property owner? Well, I mean, I, I just spoke to that, uh, Allison. So it is very viable. Um, and I, I'm, I'm quite sure there'd be a, a long lineup of interested parties if that was to be a long term lease. Um, and it, it's something that, uh, I mean, just for people's uh, own interest, I mean, I, I grew up here in Vancouver. So anyone who's 50 or, or, or older like me will remember when the building we're sitting in right now. Uh, was redeveloped and it's, I'm at the education center here and it's essentially a long-term lease as well. Uh, so there is precedent even within this school uh, district of this happening. So um, I don't anticipate any problem with there being very interested parties uh, for the site at the south end of the Fleming uh, site. Okay, and what if the survey feedback overwhelmingly disagrees that the site be disposed of? Will the site be returned to the use of the students? The um, the board motion that's that's being considered right now is just to declare the site surplus to the district's future educational needs. Um, it would only be a, if the board adopted that motion would the um, would the next stage of policy 20 kick in, which would be then the actual disposition. So and it's up to the board at this point in time to we go through this consultation process. Um, all the feedback will be provided to the board and then it'll be their decision as to whether they declare the site surplus, which would then kick in the next phase of the, of the policy. OK, um, and if portables are required at Fleming, uh, where will they go and how will it affect the outdoor spaces? So Perhaps, perhaps I'll lead off on that one. So there's there's no intention to situate portals at Fleming, um, but of course we are concerned about the availability of adequate outdoor play space, excellent outdoor play space for students. And um, I, I will pass it to, to Michael, who has some you know information about the play space that is is in design. Yeah. So thank you, John. Uh, as John said. Uh, some of the feedback that that I think we'd be looking for in, in this feedback survey is uh, some feedback around the play space. Uh, the play when the, the old Fleming building is 
uh, finished its demolition stage of the seismic mitigation program. Uh, the uh, there is going to be a a, a soccer field uh, in it in its place. Like David Green said, there's also going to be a parking lot uh, that basically borders uh, this this space that we're talking about tonight. Uh, and uh, around the current Fleming site, uh, the new Fleming site, there's uh, like I said before, there's the playground space and uh, an amphitheater built in uh, for outdoor education uh, needs uh, for the school to use. But yeah, we, we'd definitely be looking uh, for feedback from the community around that play space, if there is any. Okay, next question. Um, if there was a 14 story building built, would the children in the development be able to attend Fleming Elementary considering there is no excess capacity? And uh, perhaps, uh, John, are you able to address that? Uh, yes, I am able to address that. So um, certainly if there was a 14 story building developed on that corner, we'd have to consider as a district how to accommodate those children at a nearby school. Uh, as you can see, the forecasts indicate it'll be close to 100 um, you know, surplus spaces at Fleming, so to speak, in the next few years. So on the kind of development timeline that might happen. It's quite hypothetical. Uh, there will be plenty of space at that school to accommodate likely student yields from a building of that size. Um, in high-rise buildings, typically in Vancouver, depending on the level of affordability, of course, we you know we get between uh, one and three students per hundred units. So uh, you know, a 14-floor building. I, I'm not going to do math in my head, but it, it would certainly not yield 100 students. All right. Your estimate for future educational needs may be wrong given the amount of rental units being created. Building more residential here could further add the burden on Fleming School. Why not wait a few years and see if the estimates are actually trending downward before making this decision? And John, are you able to speak to this one as well? Yeah, it's, it's, it's two two separate questions. Um, I think I think there is a recognition there's a need for rental accommodation in Vancouver. So, um, and, and I think there's evidence that the enrollment at Fleming is declining because we have a four year trend. And so if development yields more students, that's a good news story because now you have a school that's closer to its capacity, it's serving community needs and you have rental accommodation. So, um, but regardless, you know, uh, the, the enrollment forecast stands and the building capacity stands. And so the building capacity isn't going to change regardless of whether or not this site is, is available for lease or for sale. And and I guess that's the point of looking at capacity in surrounding schools because of the unlike the eventuality that there's insufficient capacity at Fleming, there'd be capacity at a, a school nearby. Okay, next question. Can you tell us about past examples of lands that were determined as surplus and what happened to them? How are they being used now? Um, perhaps, I don't know if this would be uh, maybe a question for David Green or, um, or for Andrew perhaps, or James? Yeah, Allison, it's James. I'm aware of one example. And Hayden O'Connor is aware, brought it to my attention that this was quite a number of years ago, but the Queen Mary Elementary School at the in the west side of Vancouver originally had some property on the periphery of the school that uh, was deemed surplus and single family homes were created in the, uh, it's not noticeable now, but at that time there was a, a larger parcel of property and so that's been was sold off for single family homes. And again, in that particular school, there was no impact on enrollments or any appreciable difference in terms of the impact of the school community. So that's one example that I'm aware of. And of course, there's always been uh, uh, airspace parcels created for the city to create air child care centers, such as the Fleming School. That's a uh, 10 or more year lease 
So that in fact is a disposition of airspace for the childcare. So those are two examples for you. And I Thank think I, and another one, another example earlier, where you talked about the, the VSB Education Center. <clears throat> I mean, the um, VSB owns all of the land between Granville Street and First Street and West Broadway and 10th. Um, so we occupy the building that we that we work in. Uh, the Triton building was an apartment building next built next to us from that that um, from that um, long term lease that we entered into and um, <clears throat> all of the commercial buildings along Granville and West Broadway uh, were the result of, of that that transaction. Thank you, David. Um, what does effective land management mean? Fulfill a short term funding gap. What about the long term? Will space be needed in 25 years? How much more will it cost? Why is the VSB thinking short term? What are the long range 25 year, 50 year forecasts? Well, I, I can take that one. I, what I would say is that's why we're leasing it. Uh, so that it is available down the road. And um, another important point is, you know, as our region grows, our city's transforming. And uh, there's lots of great examples of new schools being built in Vancouver and other municipalities that, um, you know, Fleming itself, it's not the, uh, the old like one story school that, uh, you know, has endless amounts of land. We've all had to become more efficient with land. Um, so to me, effective land management is is taking probably your most valuable asset, the land, and putting it to work for you so you can accomplish uh, your goals and objectives uh, in whatever you're doing. In this case, building schools, making schools safe. And um, if that can be done by long term lease where you don't lose the asset, then uh, we have to realize how fortunate we are because uh, I work right across the province and there's lots of places in the province where they don't have that luxury. It's only sale that will work. And unfortunately, um, that does tie your hand down the road. Okay, thank you. Um, and what other remnant sites exist in the VSB? Have they or will they go through the surplus process? And uh, I don't know we if have, this would be for David. Um, we, you know, we there may be other sites that that um, that we are aware of that might might be considered by um, to be going through this process. But um, it's not a question to answer tonight, really. It's a question for us to bring it to the board for the board to make that decision to to look at whether they want to. Um, you know, look at any other sites that that might be remnant sites or could become remnant sites. All right, thank you. Um, and what is planned of the mixed use development or for the mixed use development specifically? Will it include space that could be converted to education space if the need arises for more space in the future? And perhaps Andrew James. Well, I can start and, and James can jump in, but it, it, it's very preliminary. Like uh, we put together some illustrations just to show the scale of development. There has been no uh, detailed like market assessment to see what makes sense there. If it's residential, if it's office, that's something that would only happen if the board decides to move forward and go into the second phase. John, are you jumping in there or can we move well, on to the next one? I, I can I can jump in. I mean, just to reiterate that the you know <laughs> the forecast um, doesn't indicate a need for additional educational space at that site or, or in the surrounding sites. Um, so so but I think Andrew's point is the more salient one, which is that it's too preliminary to to determine the use of, of any building that might be developed there because we haven't put out an RFP yet.
Okay, and next question uh, during the presentation, there was a mention of the of uh, least cost option. Does this mean lowest initial cost today? What is the life cycle analysis? And Andrew, are you able to answer this question? The reference to um, <clears throat> least cost option was in the context of uh, submitting projects to the uh, provincial government for the seismic mitigation program. And they um, <clears throat> they literally do not cover life cycle costs or deferred maintenance costs when they consider uh, what the lease cost options are. So that's that's what was referred to in the context of the lease cost option. Okay, and why are you not considering green space for community use? So I, I think uh, I, I can start. Um, there, there will be space for community use after school hours in the, in the, the play space. Um, but there's a there's a another goal as well, another value, which is to generate some revenue for for um, capital fund capital projects. So uh, it's it's possible that somebody would come forward and offer to pay fair market value to make a green space, but that's that's unlikely. So the likelihood is that you'll need to do some development on that uh, parcel of land to generate something approaching fair market value and and um, you know it's the current expectation that that the board would like to get something approaching fair market value for that for that land in order to achieve the goal of funding capital projects in the DSP. and i can add to that I can add to that in the sense that, you know, if we can generate some capital revenue, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the, it has to be green space created at the Fleming site, but it could it could raise the opportunity that we could do something at another site if we ended up having to, um, <clears throat> you know, if we had the opportunity to, to replace a school with a new school, that could open up the doors opportunity for, for more green space for community use. Okay, next question. Is there room for a regulation sized soccer field for Fleming? That's a great question for Michael Rossi. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that, that is a great question. Uh, I've been doing some digging into what is what is regulation for an elementary school soccer field. Uh, what I what I can say is uh, there is a soccer field being placed on the field. Uh, from everything that I've researched, uh, it, it is regulation size at 45 meters uh, by 75 meters, uh, but I, I don't know exactly what regulation is. Uh, in the sense of elementary school soccer, uh, obviously it's it's something that we we look to get students interested in in sports, interested in physical activity, interested in in the game of soccer in this case. And so the, the goal of that space, uh, that all-weather all field that, that is going in to that site that you can see on the screen there, is to pique that interest and keep, keep students interested in uh, an active, healthy lifestyle. Okay, next question um, has to do with where enrollment statistics are coming from. So uh, perhaps this is one for you, John, um, on where those numbers come from. And uh, this person, you know, cites news coverage um, about kindergarten waitlists at schools um, and wants to know where these stats are coming from. Right, so I mean, I, I, wa I want to lead off by reiterating this really um, the focus of this potential subdivision likely wouldn't be enrollment forecasting because regardless of the disposal or not of this land, it's not going to have a great deal of influence on enrollment at the school or space at the school. So, um, and, and uh, the enrollment, you know, the, the district does have a long range facilities plan that you can link to um, at the same, from the same site that we're showing the plumbing project information. And that has a considerable amount of detail about enrollment, enrollment forecasting. And uh, there, you know, there's numerous, <laughs> there's been a, a great deal of work done on providing a reliable and accurate enrollment forecasting for Fleming and other schools in the district. 
OK, and this question is um, specifically to Andrew. Is the disposition now guaranteed to be a lease? Well, well nothing's guaranteed until the board makes a decision to proceed to the next uh, the next phase. So um, our working um, directions are to look at leases for all of these sites. So um, I guess the board will ultimately decide if that's the best path forward. And the board. Board has, I mentioned earlier, the board has passed a motion that would preclude a, a fee simple sale. So um, a lease would be the option. If I could add, however, this is James, uh, that the, the, the current zoning option and the revenue derived therefrom is based on a fee simple sale. So just to clarify that although board may choose to do otherwise. The valuation for the current zoning is based on fee simple sales. Thank you. As more affordable housing is made available through land assemblies and laneway houses, the population will increase. What is the forecast based on today? Part two is the Fleming School designed so more stories can be added to the building. So, so I think uh, we've addressed the enrollment forecasting um, question on, on several occasions now, but the enrollment forecast does take into account development trends because that's captured in, in migration and out migration to a neighborhood. The Fleming building itself is capped. There's a childcare, a rooftop childcare with outdoor play space. So the building has no further capacity to increase in size, either in height or, and there's no anticipation of expanding the building. Um, so it's designed as is at its current capacity. Okay, and a question on remnant sites. Why Fleming and not others? How is it balanced and based on fairness? And perhaps this is uh, David Green. Are you able to speak to this? Or James? Fleming site. The, the remnant piece at the Fleming site became fairly obvious when the new school was where, when the new school was built and the plan to you know build the playing field and the parking lot. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, I mean it, it's the that that 2450 square meter site uh, will provide a natural buffer to the rest of the school site. Um, so <clears throat> the um, Whereas right now, or with the old school, you know, basically, um, you know, your the students and the staff were, were, you know, looking at 49th and Knight Street all the time, and so it just became obvious that you know here was an opportunity to, to uh, with a site redesign to declare that site as remnant. If I could add as well, uh, Mr. Green, it's James. The, the other consideration is that in addition to the fact that this is an entire reconfiguration of the site with the new school at the uh, north side of the site, uh, away from the highly trafficked intersection, the city of Vancouver has had a number of rental housing incentive programs over a number of years, and they've been incentivizing uh, potential for rezoning for a little bit higher density at arterial uh, nodes, arterial intersections, and so that combined with the reconfiguration of this site, this and a couple other locations are were always viewed as being having high potential for this consideration. Okay, next question. Is the VSB stating that funding from the ministry is inadequate and therefore the site's disposition is needed to fulfill funding shortfalls? Why is there a funding shortfall? Uh, David Green, are you able to address this? As we said earlier, the, the Ministry of Education will fund the, um, the lowest cost option in the seismic mitigation project. Um, <clears throat> And in order to uh, enhance those projects into, you know, replacement schools, uh, we would need to generate capital revenue in order to do that. All 
right. Uh, so next question. Um, this is a, a question for Andrew. Um, what 10 sites have been identified? You referenced 10, uh, 10 sites during the presentation. Yeah, that, uh, and that, that's the work that we've been doing uh, with the board and I'm going to leave that with the board for now. Um, as obviously um, things like speculation and land values are directly impacted by um, sharing all that information. So for the time being, that's with the, the board. And if I could just reiterate once again, in case people have joined us you know, along the way, you know, the, the, the goal and the intent of this evening's engagement is to get feedback that is specifically related to you know, the proposal is on the table, which is a subdivision of a piece of the Fleming site. Uh, and and the, cert, the online survey is targeted to the to feedback about that site. There is an open-ended section where people can um, provide their thoughts on anything related to land asset management, but really the information we're gonna be bringing forward to the board and to the facilities planning committee will be about feedback related directly to the Fleming site and the merits of this proposal. OK, the next uh, question isn't um, isn't really a question, more of a statement, but perhaps we can. It's something that we can speak to. Um, this person says this is short term thinking once sold or leased, then the future opportunity to acquire land for the purpose to serve the community will cost double, if not triple. Um, uh, perhaps James, are you able to speak to that concern? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Sure. This is short term thinking. Once sold or leased, then the future opportunity to acquire land for the purpose to serve the community will cost double, if not triple. Yeah, and I think I'll just reiterate, I think that's a consistent theme in terms of people's desire to, to have and the board uh, indicating that long term leases are favored over outright sales. So that's definitely a theme that we're taking note of. And it, it's one thing that can be noted in the survey without question. Uh, there certainly, whether it's the city of Vancouver or the Vancouver School Board, there is a changing urban fabric. So the ability to uh, be fairly uh, adaptive to ch the changing urban environment is really quite important. So a, a leasing does provide that option to in the long term provide for the asset to sit with the uh, public domain. However, uh, with you know 840 million, I think is the deferred maintenance liability with the school board, you know, the ability to provide funding for that is a critical component of being adaptive. And so, uh, you know, these are all good points and comments and something we'll take into to advisement. And just a little bit further on the, the sort of nature of you know, whether this is short term or long term thinking. Um, if, if capital revenue is generated and that capital revenue is used to enhance and support capital projects, I, I think that falls into the category of long term thinking because there's a, you know, educational community and broader community benefit to having very good schools in our communities. And um, and we can enhance those projects demonstrably with additional funding. So uh, although it's a, an opportunity to you know, generate capital in a relatively short time frame, the impact of that capital will be felt over multiple generations. So um, I, I think it's a little bit of a mischaracterization just to say it's short term thinking. I think we're demonstrating long term thinking here. OK, next question um, with long term leases, is the funding typically provided upfront trade, i.e. the education center or over time? i.e. Kingsgate Mall. Uh, with the Education Centre, the funding was provided up front and it, it was um, it was a prepaid lease and it, the money went to actually build the BSB building that we work in now. Um, the, I think the, I'm not sure what the question about Kingsgate Mall is. It is, um, uh, oh, sorry, I've just lost it on my screen here. Um, oh, long term, long term funding. 
I'm not sure the context. For the, it, they were giving an example of um, of different ways that um, that these leases are funded. So if um, I could, if I could also yeah. add to this is James speaking in the in my experience, I've seen examples of prepaid leases that are in installments of say 10 and 20 year installments. So so three installments of 20 years over a 60 year period, for example, those are examples where you're doing shorter term payments, but over a longer term lease. So that flexibility is always there and there's pros and cons of each. Obviously, uh, you know, if you need to inject a very large amount of funding towards a new school, for example, a single lump sum prepaid lease is probably favored. But there are lots of instances I've seen where it's uh, uh, it could be annual payments, it could be five year lease payments, 10 year, 20 year. So hopefully that answers that part of the question too. Thank you. The pandemic has illustrated the need for more space for outdoor education. Students need more outdoor space, not less. The parking lot could be relocated and the space could be another playing field and rented out. Has this option been thought of? Maybe Michael Rossi, are you able to speak to this? I can talk a little bit about uh, the parking lot actually. Uh, so the parking lot in the design process of this uh, of the Fleming project. Obviously, every everything that uh, is developed on a site has to go through city permitting processes. And so the the parking lot, uh, if you can see on this on this visual on the screen, actually comes in right directly across from that alley. And so that was a requirement uh, for the permitting process to have the parking lot enter right at that alleyway. I think with respect to outdoor space, there's consensus with respect to COVID that being outdoors is, is a safe place to be. Um, but, you know, should the subdivision proceed, uh, we, we think there's still sufficient play space available to accommodate the students at that school. So whether or not students are five meters apart or, or three meters apart outside, being outside is the key to, to COVID safety, um, as far as I understand it. with the information available. Okay, and um, uh, along a similar line, a, a question about whether there's been any uh, any chat with the Vancouver Park Board um, around potential green space. Well, we're in the first phase of the, the um, process, which is determining whether the site is in fact surplus to the needs of the district. Um, once if we proceed to the second phase, then public entities, including the park board, can come forward with proposals, um, but we're not there yet. So we haven't engaged in any um, conversation with any proponent because we haven't put out an RFP yet. Okay, and that leads into the next question. Um, what comes first, rezoning or the RFP? <laughs> Uh, I, I can continue and then, and then Andrew can back clean up, but the RFP comes first. Um, and then it's actually at the point of when the disposition is, is concluded, the negotiation, it, it's actually over to the, the city for the rezoning process. And I think Andrew can probably add some more detail to that brief answer. Yeah, no, you're right, John. Well, uh, the RFP would come first to determine what makes the most sense for that site. And then they would initiate the, the rezoning process if need be um with the city right like i mentioned that the corner of night and 49th is actually c1 it's a attractive zone who knows what point i might want to just keep that okay and a another question related to um financing uh if money comes in uh as a lease payment slowly yet vsb needs to spend a lot up front capital projects how will this be financed david green i'm sorry i'm not sure i could you repeat the question please sure 
If money comes in as a lease payment slowly, yet VSB needs to spend a lot up front, capital projects, how will this be financed? We would not be able to um, <clears throat> advance those capital projects. Uh, we don't have the ability to borrow funds uh, unless it's with the authority of the Minister of Education, uh, which is seldom been approved in the province of British Columbia. So we would not be able, if we had an opportunity to enhance a seismic project and didn't have the funding to do it, then we wouldn't be able to do it. And we would have to, um, if it was a seismic project and we were dealing with the lowest cost option, we would end up with the lowest cost option, which would be a seismic upgrade. Okay. And uh, we are uh, just got a few questions left. And just a reminder to anyone who's tuned in, if you uh, do want to submit any more questions, we've got about 10 minutes left in the session. So um, please get those in. And let's go to the next one. Um, does the VSB feel that the ministry is uh, ministry is funding based on short term thinking and therefore the VSB feels the need to dispose of land in order to create revenue to fill that gap? Uh, David Green. <clears throat> the ministry of Education has um, <clears throat> two funding mechanisms. They have the money for the seismic mitigation program, which they use to support seismic projects in the, in the province. And then there's the um, capital expansion, um, new school funding that school districts use to or submit requests every year in a five year capital plan to um, to request funding for new schools and expansion. So um, those are the uh, mechanisms by which the Ministry of Education has capital funding for school districts. Okay, and um, by repurposing, does this mean that VSB would get the property rezoned? We've covered some of that. Do any of these options include future potential school spaces? So, so I'll just, I guess it's a bit better, but the, the rezoning, um, would, would come after uh, a proponent has, has been selected and it would be I, I'm not sure Andrew would it be a shared responsibility or if it's a fully the responsibility of the proponent and since no no proposal has been put forward there's been no conversation about additional educational spaces but just want to reiterate the school has capacity uh, you know it has sufficient capacity in the future yeah, just to, to back up what John was saying, we, we would wait to see first if there's interest to go on to the next phase and then have an RFP issued. And at that time, depending on what the proposal was, um, the board could could choose to, to, to partner with someone and go through the process together. But more likely, the proponent would go through the rezoning process if need be on their own. Um, they would they would have the um, the expertise to do that. And I suppose as a, as a practical matter, the, the school is located at extreme you know, northeast of the site. The land is at the extreme south end of the site. So it'd be unlikely we'd want to run sort of two campuses on site. Uh, I couldn't see that being practical for, for an elementary school. Um, yeah. Andrew, did you want to jump in there? Or are you? Oh, I, 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 I added, uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I added. You're good, okay. Okay, just saw your camera go on there. Okay, and this question is specifically a follow up to um, uh, an answer from David Green just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, so then if this site is disposed of as a lease where money comes in slowly, those monies can't be used to fund major capital projects where lots of money is needed up front. Does that then not mean that a disposition sale is needed? Um, no, I think that any any potential disposition of land that could generate capital funding for it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a particular project that may not be able to be funded. We don't have enough funding from the lease, but there may be opportunities for other capital uh, projects to be undertaken or other 
um, capital, you know, works to be to be done. Um, for example, you know, we could um, in a in a seismic upgrade, we could fund something that was um, not not covered off by the lowest cost option. For example, we could you know address accessibility issues, or we could um, you know enhance um, the the playgrounds in the school or something like that. Um, so we could still use capital funding for other purposes. And maybe I'll just add, Allison, like um, there are different models for leasing for sure, but the vast majority of um, leases in our region are paid up front. Um, and that's what the, most people are familiar with. Um, it doesn't matter if it's the residential tower here right next to the education center, they paid it all up front. Those people who own those condos or at UBC or at SFU or down in Falls Creek, that's the, the most common form. Okay, um, well, it looks like we are, uh, Looks like we are at the end of our queue. Any last minute questions that um, anyone wants to get into the queue? Okay, not seeing anything more come in. Okay, well maybe I can just uh do a little bit of a closure here then Allison. Thanks so much for the, all that uh, moderation and, and uh, question reading. Um, just want to take the opportunity to uh, say thanks to all the participants in uh, this, this session, this engagement session on behalf of the Vancouver School Board. Um, you know, thanks for the uh, uh, perceptive questions and just want to reiterate the same message, which is that you're really encouraged to participate in providing feedback about this proposal of the disposition of the south portion of Fleming site uh, via that feedback survey. Thanks so much. Uh, there is another session at 7 p.m. should you wish to uh, participate again. Have a good evening. Thank you.